Welcome to part 10 of topic 5. In part 10 we will discuss the row vibrational spectra of polyatomic molecules. Having discussed the vibrational spectra of polyatomic molecules I want to now discuss the row vibrational spectra of polyatomic molecules. The selection rules for the rotational transitions of polyatomic molecules depends on the symmetry whether it is parallel or perpendicular of the particular vibration that the molecule is undergoing. We can illustrate what we mean by parallel or perpendicular using water as the basis. A parallel vibration is one in which the dipole moment changes parallel to the principal axis of the molecule. So for example, the symmetric stretch leads to changes of the dipole moment that occur parallel to the principal axis. A perpendicular vibration is one in which there is a component to the change in the dipole moment that is perpendicular to the principal axis. The asymmetric stretch illustrates this quite nicely. We'll start off with the row vibrational spectra of linear molecules. Such molecules can have either parallel or perpendicular vibrations. So what are the selection rules for a parallel vibrational mode? Well again, delta V, the change in the vibrational state, can be equal to plus or minus 1, or plus or minus 2, etc. And delta J can be equal plus or minus 1 again. And so we get a spectrum with a similar appearance to that we had for diatomic molecules. We'll get P and R branches appearing in the rho vibrational band. This is known as a PR band profile, just like the classic PR band profile we saw for HCl. For HCl we saw that there was a gap missing in the middle of the vibrational band, that is when delta J was equal to zero, and that doesn't occur because it is not allowed for a parallel vibrational mode. For a diatomic molecule of course there is only a parallel vibrational mode. But for a polyatomic system, it is possible to have a perpendicular mode, that is, a bending mode. So does that make any difference? Well, delta V is equal to plus or minus 1 or plus or minus 2, etc. But now you see the difference. For a perpendicular vibrational mode, for a linear molecule, delta J can be equal to 0. So we now can get another band appearing in our row vibrational profile. We'll have a P branch associated with delta J is equal to minus 1. We'll have an R branch associated with delta J is equal to plus 1. But we'll also have a Q branch associated with delta J is equal to 0. The Q branch will be right in the center of the P and R branches. And all Q branch transitions are going to be overlapping and we get what is called a PQR band profile. If you've done the HCl experiment, you would have seen this because you would have seen the carbon dioxide that is present in your sample. You would have noticed that you can't get rid of all the carbon dioxide in the system. At around about 2350 wave numbers, you've got the asymmetric stretch of carbon dioxide and that had a PR band profile. But if you look down at around 667 wave numbers, it would have shown a classic PQR band profile. The Q branch appears because delta J is equal to zero. Here is the symmetric stretch of a linear molecule, this time HCN. For this vibration we get a classic PR band profile because we have both the P and R branches and nothing in the center. This must be therefore a parallel vibration. Let's have a look at carbon dioxide. This is what you would have seen in your HCl experiment at around 2350 wave numbers. On the left at lower frequencies we have the P branch and on the right at higher frequencies we have the R branch and we are missing a line in the center here because that would be a transition for delta J is equal to zero. Again we've got a PR band profile so this has to be a parallel vibration. What about the perpendicular mode though? 
Well, we have noted that the selection rule for a perpendicular mode is that delta j is equal to 0 or plus or minus 1. This means that for a perpendicular mode we can have a p branch where delta j is equal to minus 1 and an r branch where delta j is equal to plus 1. But we can also get a transition where j doesn't change, where delta j is equal to 0. Notice, however, that for each of the R branch transitions they occur at frequencies that are higher than the fundamental frequency and for the P branch they are at lower frequencies than the fundamental. However, if delta J doesn't change, if I go from J equals 0 to J equals 0 or J equals 1 to J equals 1 or 2 to 2 or 3 to 3 the energy gap will almost be the same. It would be slightly different because B0 is slightly different from B1 so there will be slight difference but it will be pretty close and so because of that all of these lines associated with delta J is equal to zero are going to overlap with one another so we would expect that the central spike associated with the Q branch to be quite intense and that is indeed what we see so this is what we get for HCN this is the bending mode for HCN which is a perpendicular vibrational mode. So we've got both our P and R branches. And in the center here, we've got an intense Q branch. This is a PQR band profile, and we are going to have exactly the same thing for carbon dioxide. This vibrational band is centered at 667 wave numbers. So we've got our P and R branches and we have also got this intense Q branch where all the lines are overlapping with one another. The lines in the P and R branches are of course separated, they are not lying on top of each other. For the Q branch they are all lying on top of each other and so you can see it is quite intense. You can identify it quite easily. This is a PQR band profile which in a linear molecule implies a perpendicular band. So this is the row vibrational spectrum for carbon dioxide we showed at the start of part 8. We've got a PR branch centered at around 2350 wave numbers and because the spectrum is fairly low resolution you're not able to pick out the rotational fine structure in the bands. But at high resolution this is what we would see and this is associated with the asymmetric stretch of course. During the asymmetric stretch the dipole moment is changing along the principal axis. But for the bending mode it is changing perpendicular to the principal axis so now we get a Q branch appearing and again we cannot see the rotational fine structure unless we look at high resolution. The reason why delta J was equal to plus or minus 1 was because we needed to conserve angular momentum. The photon had one unit of angular momentum. We just didn't know if it was plus 1 or minus 1. And the angular momentum of the molecule was associated with its rotational structure, that is which J state it was in. And so the photon, when it gets absorbed, transfers its angular momentum to the molecule and so the angular momentum of the molecule either goes up by one or down by one. That was the reason why delta J was equal to plus or minus one. Now all of a sudden I'm telling you that for a perpendicular band in linear molecules we can have delta J is equal to zero. Where did the angular momentum of the photon go? I will illustrate this in class on Thursday but ultimately the angular momentum goes into the bending vibration this type of vibration has angular momentum and so what is happening when the photon is absorbed the angular momentum isn't being lost it just has been put into vibrational angular momentum and not rotational angular momentum and that's the reason why it occurred for the bending mode for the asymmetric stretch or the symmetric stretch there is no angular momentum associated with these vibrations there is no breaking of the conservation of angular momentum but angular momentum can come under many guises. This is the end of part 10 for topic 5. Please continue on to part 11.